I'm going to begin a, a series this morning uh, that we're going to be talking about, um, just looking at, at God's Word from a different perspective. So grab your Bibles and join with me to the book of um, Genesis chapter 4. And I need to encourage you, um, today is just the beginning, and this morning I was not able to get too far. So I don't know how far we'll get uh, this afternoon. We'll kind of see what the Lord leads, but we want to stay within the same vein. I want to begin... Um, just laying a good foundation for what I believe um, the Word of God is teaching us. Because here's what, what I've learned. John chapter 4, as you go to Revel- I mean Genesis, the Bible says this in John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. And to help you with context, it is right where when Jesus encountered that woman at the well, and as he was sitting with the woman at the well, you know her story, her situation, where she um, from Samaria came to the well at 12 in the afternoon because she was pretty much a societal reject. And as she encountered God, one of the first things that surfaced in their conversation was where should I worship? She said to him, I know you Jews worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans worship here on Mount Gerizim. And this is Jesus' response to her. Jesus said to her, yet a time is coming and has now come where the true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the verse says, For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Does anybody know God is spirit? Come on, let me see your hand if you know that. Yeah. And so we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I want to flesh that out a little bit this morning because here is me. And as I continue to grow in Christ, I am learning more and more that worship is not about the song. Let me rephrase. Worship is not restricted solely to the song. Come on, say amen if you believe that. Yeah, most of us think that we come to the worship experience and we sing some songs and here's what we said, and we're finished with the worship segment of the service. Now let's go to Word. So here's what we do. I'm going to miss worship. I'm just going to come in time for the Word because all I need is the Word so I can be well. If I were to say to you, all of that is worship. Come on, y'all. And the reason, the reason, the reason a lot of our worship lives and a lot of our worship experiences are not where it needs to be because we don't have a good definition of what worship is. And, and that's why I want to kind of talk of uh, giving as an act of worship this morning because worship has more to do or everything to do about how we approach God. Does that make sense? Worship has to do with who God is, what he means to us in our lives, and more importantly, what place does God have in our life? So today, I want to look at Genesis chapter 4, a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. If you have been at Restoration any length of time, you've heard us speak about this passage before. You've heard us revisit it several times. But I think there's something fresh that God wants us to extract from this passage, and I want to look at it with you uh, this morning. So let us pray before we read that I want to read, and we're going to walk through it together that God would, was, would move and have his way. So bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you for you. I pray for preaching power, God, just strength to say what you would have me to say again. Um, renew afresh. We want a fresh anointing. We don't want this morning's anointment, anointing because we want to hear from you, God. We want to be about who you would have us to be. So we love you. Open our hearts to receive, to understand, and to be all that you would have us to be. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay, so grab your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 4. And when you get there, let me know you're there by saying amen. Amen. That's only two amen. There's about five people in here. So let me hear some more amen. Yeah, good. There you go. A lot better. Good. There's more y'all in here. Amen. Good, 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 good. Okay. Verse 1 says of chapter 4, Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel, and it says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, 
But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face or his countenance fell. Verse 6 says, And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why have your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But my translation says, but you must rule over it. Now, you need to know that when it comes to this issue of of this passage that we're about to encounter in Genesis chapter 4, understand with me that this is not the beginning of Scripture. It kind of goes back a little further to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3. So to bring you up to speed and to help you see what I want you to, what I'm hoping you see in Scripture this morning is in Genesis chapter 1, it begins with the fact that God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 2 talks about the creation of man. It gives us a little bit of detail about the creation of man. Chapter 3 goes into the issue that men sin and God punished them and the consequences of sin. And then chapter 4 just opens up with what I'm going to refer to as this weird introduction just in the middle of nowhere. Here comes the story. And what's striking about this story is that you have two individuals by way of quick summation that came to worship God. One, and they both brought gifts to God. Let me use the word gift intentionally till I get to where I want to go. One was accepted and one was rejected. And to just help you process this as we kind of go through this, my conclusion is their approach in worship was completely different, which dictated whether their, whether their gift was accepted or rejected by God. Their approach had everything to do with it. So do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, how do you approach God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, turn to the next person and say, neighbor, how do you approach God? Yeah, I love my worship team, so don't get me wrong, but sometimes the worship team will say to me, are these the songs we're doing for worship? And I just smile. I do. I really do. I smile because I know worship is not about the song, right? You kind of get where I'm going? You get, all right? Does that make sense? So big idea. Put the big idea on the screen. Here's what I want you all to take away with me um, today. Our approach to worship dictates both the quantity and the quality of our gift to God. Our approach to worship dictates both the quantity and the quality of our gift to God. Normally, When I do my research or exegetical work, um, the first thing I try to come up with after all of that is just what's the big idea, right? What's the author saying? What's the author saying about what the author's saying? So I came up with my thought, and um, as normal, my poor kids and my family, they get to be the recipients of everything first before it goes anywhere. And so I um, remember texting this to my wife very early in the morning and says, what are your thoughts on this? And um, it took her a while to respond, and then she finally responded, and all she said was processing. That's all she said. And um, I hate it when she processes. I do. I really do. I mean, because I feel ignored. Do I look serious right now? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I have issues. Yeah, pray for me. I do. And so she said processing, and then she finally comes into my office, right? And then um, I'm like, you going to say something? And then she says, I don't know what to think about that. I'm like, why not? And she says, because it sounds like that you're saying that, um, that let me see if I can quote her right this, this time. Um, she, it sounds like you're saying that if I don't give, then my worship life is messed up. Did I get you right? Somewhat like that? Yeah. And then I kind of, and she says, that don't sound right. I said, it sure does. Right? And don't think give financially right now. You guys do not, don't make that mistake yet, okay? So, because I want people to understand how what God gets out of me is all predicated on my attitude towards him. Come on, y'all. Married folk, married folk, go like that. We're in the classroom, right? Here's what happens. When you have a two towards your spouse, guess what they get from you? None. Yeah, y'all know I'm right about it. You kind of get what I'm saying? If our attitude is not right in approaching God, guess what he gets from us? Not what he should, 
right? And I want us to flesh this out because that's the problem, that's the tension that's going on in the text, and I want to look at it uh, carefully today as we walk through it. So go with me, put the first point on the screen. Let me start here because this is very, very important that we know, number one, that God deserves to be worshipped. Come on, say this. God deserves to be worshipped. Say it again. Say, God deserves to be worshipped. And I'm going to keep sounding like a broken record for the entire series because we're going to go to some heavy places in this. Don't think that because you're singing to God, you're worshiping him. All right? Don't do that, okay? Me singing love songs to Katani, we got kids in here, right, does not mean I'm making love to her. I'm just singing to her. Y'all was like, ooh, yeah. (laughs) right? I'm just singing to her. And a lot of us, all we do is sing to God, but we don't know how to make love to him. Oh, Jesus, that's something else. Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, that's all we're doing is singing, singing. Oh, you look good. You sound good. You're gracious. You're whatever. And he's like, you're done? We're going to talk about that, okay? Very, very important. So God deserves to be worshipped. So here's what's happening in the text. Time had elapsed. Adam and Eve has sinned, and we're going to flesh this out a little bit. And verse 1 of chapter 4 opens up by saying, as time progressed, and don't make the mistake of hearing Scripture linearly, meaning that because something happened this day, that the very next day something else happened, and the very next day something else happened. Um, This is me, okay, so don't nobody go with me. This is just me. The more I flesh this passage out, um, the text says this, now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel, and it says, now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and and Cain was a worker of the ground. Stop right there, okay? Now, I'm the crazy guy that most people will say this is a first child. It very well could be, and according to Scripture, as far as we know, it is. But I want to say this is her first male son, which kind of leaves a little bit of wiggle room to say maybe she had daughters before. I don't know. I don't know, okay? But here's the point I want to point out here. It says here when it says Adam knew his wife, the Hebrew word is the Hebrew word yada, which simply means they had an intimate relationship. They had sexual intercourse, and the offspring of that was the son. Now, the reason you need to know that is because you understand in the garden, Childbirth was not a laborious thing, even though they had no children while in the garden. We'll flesh this out on Wednesday. Now they're out of the garden. They give birth to two children, and I find it interesting that as time progressed, we find this family in a worship environment. Does anybody find that striking, right? They're in this worship environment, and and they're giving a tribute and worship to God. Now, notice about Cain, okay? Cain now, all of a sudden, because he is the firstborn, he has the same vocation as his daddy, okay? So his daddy was a tiller of the ground. That's how God made him. That's how God created him. And so when you read Genesis, while in the garden, you see Adam working the ground. But it was no sweat. It was no toil. Stuff was just popping up everywhere because God was in control. Now, out of the garden, he maintains the same vocation. He is a tiller of the ground, but his boys now, his son now, carries the occupation where he finds himself tilling the ground, okay? And so here's what I want you to know to kind of lock into this as it relates to God wants to be worshipped. Don't don't miss this about the text. In the garden, when God was in the garden with them, um, the Scripture says it this way in Genesis chapter 2, in the cool of the, I think it's two or three, in the cool of the day, God would come down and God would fellowship with Adam and Eve. You guys remember this? Come on, this is pre-fall. This is before the sin, right? Here's what you would happen. God would come down. God would fellowship. God would commune with them. They would hang out in the garden. They would do their thing. This is in the garden pre-fall. Very, very important for you not to miss this and to hear me say this by way of what we're talking about this morning. And so God, the reason that happened in the garden is because God wants fellowship. God wants to commune with you. 
God wants to commune with me. Come on. We are created for worship. We're created to fellowship with God. We're created to worship with God. So you have to visualize this. Pre-fall, God would hang out with Adam and Eve in the garden. He would spend time with them. Then all of a sudden, something went wrong. Y'all know the story quite well. And Pastor Kay and I are going to be teaching on this in the upcoming weeks in a little while. Satan comes in. And Satan tempts the woman to say to her, did God really say you shall not eat from every fruit of the garden? Um, and he says, if you eat it, you're going to become like God where your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to know good from evil. Well, the woman fell for it. She partook. And then here's the thing I want you to understand now. Because of sin, they're no longer in the garden with God. They're outside of the garden. You guys okay with that? Okay, so, so before, pre-fall, they were in the garden, they had fellowship, God puts them out, they no longer have access to the garden, but what I find striking in the text is the fellowship is not broken. Somebody going to get this in a little while, okay? This is good stuff, and it'll really encourage you because God wants to be to fellowship. Now, notice with me, here is this family Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel outside the garden in this context where they're about to worship God. And, and if I'm God and, and I'm in the garden and I put you out the garden, if I'm God, I'm not saying this is what God did. If I'm God and I cut you off, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Don't look at me funny because y'all do the same thing. Yeah, you do. You got family members you don't talk to right? Family members you don't have fellowship with because of something that went wrong. Notice what God does. This transcendent God who is far yet near, lock into this, leaves his position of holiness. Oh, Jesus. Comes to a place where sinfulness resides. Just because he want to have fellowship with the folk that he created. Oh, I need an amen right there. Come on, y'all, y'all. You, you, you got to get this because if I'm God, I'm saying to you, the reason you are where you are is because you messed up, not me. I created you for holiness. You shouldn't have done what you did. Now suffer the consequences of what you did, but not the God that I serve. The God that I serve leaves the place where he is. Come on now. And he comes down to where I am just because he wants to hang out with me even though I'm not right. Oh, Jesus, come on, y'all. Give me at least three amens. Let me know we're in the room. That's good news because when I blow it, he still doesn't turn his back on me. He comes where I am so he can still fellowship with me so I can get right with him. Lord, have mercy. That's good news. Because the reason I'm here today, Pastor Karen, is because God met me where I was. The reason you're here today is because God met you where he was. Come on. He left holiness. Come on. He incarnated himself. And he came here. And, because, and the reason he does all that is because he wants the fellowship. He wants the fellowship. He wants to be worshipped. Now, I like the second thing because here's the thing about him wanting to be worshipped, right? Worship, go back, back up, back up, one more, back up. Um, worship is not only about fellowship, but it entails dialogue. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. I talk. He listens. He talks. Y'all get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I talk. He listens. He talks. I listen. How do you know all that from the text, preacher? Well, you got to read ahead to get this because notice with me, the moment Cain messed up, God opened his mouth and spoke, which leads me to believe in that worship encounter, it was not them doing all the talking and God doing all the listening. There were times when they would talk and they would be quiet and God would talk back. Come on, that's worship. Are you hearing me this morning? And, and it was a back and forth going. So here's what worship would probably look like. Here, here's what God's saying to Adam. I mean, Adam's 
saying to God, God, you know, I, I miss that garden so much. And God would say to Adam, man, I know you miss it, bro. I know you miss it, but it's going to be all right. I'm creating a greater place than this. God, when are you going to do it, Lord? Because this is just messed up right here. I mean, every time Eve has a children, she calls me names. She got to stop this, you know. And it's going to be okay. That's the consequences of sin. But I love you anyway. But come on, are you getting this? And they would talk back and forth. Here's what worship looks like for us. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say, song end. (laughs) And we never stop long enough to hear what God has to say in response to our worship. And so here's what life looks like. We go around pretending as if God is silent when God is saying you're too busy and you don't stop long enough to hear what I have to say. This is free because it's all about you. This is, come on, say worship is a dialogue. Say it again, say worship is a dialogue. Which means, which means, which means that in the atmosphere of worship, and I'm going to give you this away free, which is 24-7, we should take time long enough to allow God to reciprocate or to speak back to us. Come on, does this make sense? Are, are you hearing me this morning? Allow God an opportunity to speak back. So notice the text. Notice the text. I want us to kind of walk through this before I go to the second point. Notice what it says. It says here, Adam knew his wife, verse 1, she conceived and bore a son. Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And she bore his brother Abel, keeper of the sheep. Cain was a work of the ground. And verse 3, in the course of time, it says, they came to this worship encounter where they brought an offering, each from their respective field. Now, I have a problem. My problem is this. Last I read Genesis chapter 1, I didn't see any record of a command saying, when you come to worship, bring an offering. I didn't see that. Maybe somebody saw, we can talk about it Wednesday. Chapter 2, I don't see that. Chapter 3, I don't see any instruction saying that you owe me something, right? Because here's what happens now. We get to to verse, what what is it, verse um, verse 3, and it says, In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the fruit of the ground, uh, verse 4, of the uh, born of... Now, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions to the Lord. And and I have a problem with that because um, I don't see where the command is given that they needed to do that. So in my framework, I'm like, what's up on that? Why are they doing that? Um, Because that has been the source of a lot of problems in Christianity and in Christendom today. So if I were to take a stab on what's really going on in the text, um, I think what's really happening here is that if you look at Genesis chapter 3, when woman sinned and when man sinned and God pronounced judgment on them, once again, if I'm God and I'm holy and you're in my presence and you mess up, I'm taking you out. If I'm God, that's why some of y'all own guns today, because y'all about to take somebody out. The text does not say that God took them out, right? Where God had every right, they're messing up his garden, his holy garden, sinless garden, perfect garden, where everything is going well, they messed up. And you know the scripture, the text says, as opposed to annihilating them and starting over, look at what God does. He graces them with life and he allows them to continue to live, not in the garden, but outside the garden. Okay, let me go here, let me go here, let me, let me paint a different picture. Now, 
if you had read anything about the garden, you'll understand in Genesis chapter 2, right around between verse 10, 20, right between there, God planted the garden and it says there he put the man to work. You'll understand with me, God not only planted the garden, but he put an irrigation system in the garden that caused it to grow, right? Watch man's punishment. I'm going to put you outside the garden where there's no irrigation system. Oh, y'all not getting it. Y'all want this. Y'all want this. And so somehow, the striking thing about the text is he's outside the garden where there's no irrigation system, yet God in his graciousness allows one of the underground stream to make it over to where man is because he realized that man cannot make it. I wish I had somebody in here by himself. Understand with me that Noah's story had not happened yet, so don't act like it was raining every day. Rain had not yet hit the earth. So God is doing everything for them. And these guys had sense enough to realize that it wasn't them. Oh, I wish I had. They had sense enough to realize that it was not their doing, that it was not their work. So look at what the text says. In the course of time, the moment the ground produced, here's Adam. Hey, Cain, we've been working this for a year, man. You think something's going to come out of it? And the moment it produced, hey, Abel, you've been mating these sheep for a while. You think they're going to produce? And the moment they produce, my Bible says they brought interesting word, first time it's used in the Bible, an offering to the Lord. An offering. Come on, say offering. I want to know what an offering. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So here's the thing. I want to say, so, so let me, before you go here, here it is. Our approach in worship dictates the quality and the quantity. We're going to flesh this out. We don't have time today. We're going to do this next week. But go to the next one. Let's define this word offering now. What is an offering? Here's what an offering is. An offering is a gift offered to a divinity, a sacrifice, it says. The word is derived from the Hebrew root, which means to give And it is used in secular context, as you read other portions of the Bible, of gifts to superior persons, particularly kings, and watch why, to convey the attitude of homage and submission to that person. Okay? So here's what happened. Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve and, and no doubt Adam and Eve said this to their children, hey, y'all, we don't deserve to be out here, okay? We don't deserve to be alive. We don't deserve it. We were in the garden. We sinned and we messed up. So notice what this looked like. The first time fruit was produced, notice the first thing they did was they came in front of their king. Thank you. You got to get that. Thank you. Thank you. Critical. He didn't have to ask them. I wish I had. He didn't have to command them. He didn't have to write laws at that stage as of yet. They had sense enough to realize that the sun wasn't theirs, that they weren't watering the ground. They had sense enough to realize that they didn't have the power to cause the moon to rise. They didn't have control over the fertility of the ground. So they realized everything they received was nobody but God. So here's what they did. Lord, thank you. Thank you. As King God, thank you. You didn't have to do it, but you did. So thank you. And the first person they thanked in their worship, was the God who produced. See, my problem and your problem is a little different. We've gotten to the place where we fool ourselves to thinking it's about us. 
and that I'm the one who get up every Sunday, every morning and go to work. I'm the one who set that alarm clock. I'm the one who went to college to get that education. I'm the one who paid that car note. I'm the one. No, 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 baby. God is the one. <laughs> come on, come on. Who gave you that job? God is the one who gave you the breath that you're breathing. God is the one who gave you the activities of your limb. God is the one who gave you the mental capacity that you have. God is the one who is doing what he's doing for us. So the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, here is my minha. Here is my token of appreciation. Listen to this. Unsolicited. This is free. No $10 line was needed. Come on, y'all. Nobody had to say, Hey, Cain, sow a seed of faith. Come on, y'all. Nobody had to say, if you get in a $100 line, he'll give you a new house. Come on, in Green Valley Ranch. None of that was necessary. None of that was necessary by virtue of the fact that they realized who God was and who they were in his presence. The moment they had anything to offer, thank you. Unsolicited. Come on, is this making sense? Come on, y'all just say thank you so I know you're in the room this morning. Come on, say it again. Say thank you just so I know you're in the room. Unsolicited. They were able to bring those things and offer them to God. Come on, does this make sense? And, 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 and what I like about this, when the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, Adam and Eve had sense enough to pass the traditions on this early enough, and in response to their gratitude to God, they were able to give God what God so justly deserves. I say, I say to my wife all the time, I just sometimes for no reason, thank you, girl. What I done did now, I don't worry about it. Thank you, girl. Yeah. Vernon kind of dogged me out last week talking about pimp daddy and all that good stuff. <laughs> so I said, thank you, girl. He wasn't lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, girl. <laughs> Are you with me? Thank you. You kind of get what I'm saying? And so my token of appreciation, my gratitude to her, listen to this, is her graciousness towards me. Does this make sense? If you think she was gracious, imagine God. Oh, I need somebody in here this morning. Imagine God. Imagine the graciousness of God. So the text says, and I'm almost done. I won't keep you long. I won't keep you long. It says here, it says here, it says here, and so Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Watch the type of the offering. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Didn't do a good job with this firstborn thing. I'm going to flesh that out a little bit Wednesday because the firstborn, let me just say this, the firstborn is very, 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 very important to God. You'll remember with me when, when God sent Moses to Pharaoh to tell him, let the people go. Moses was, I mean, Pharaoh was hard-hearted until God killed his firstborn son. Then his heart was softened and he released the, the Israelites. You wonder why that is? Because his, Pharaoh's firstborn was the succeeding God to take the throne in Egypt. And so by God killing the firstborn, God literally killed the next God in succession to the throne of Egypt to show who really God is, okay? So here's the thing. Hear me say this. God has an affinity and a passion for the firstborn. The firstborn plays a, plays a critical role. And what's striking to me in the text, and we're going to deal with this next week as we kind of talked about, the firstborn son brought the lesser offering and the secondborn brought the firstborn. We'll flesh that out. We'll just lock into this. I'm saying that to say this. There's something about God and the fact that the firstborn belongs to him. Okay? And when I say firstborn, don't li uh, listen to it so much in the context of literal child, literal person. Anything that's first is offered to him in dedication and thanksgiving to him for the work that he has done in our life. So when we approach him, we need to approach with the right attitude. I want to kind of talk, put, put the next slide on the screen. Put the next slide. I want to talk through this. And let's go, next one, go to the next one. And let me hit this and then we'll talk about this and then we'll stop. So notice this. So God's response to our offering is based on our attitude when presenting our gift to him. One more time. 
God's response to our worship, and I'm using the word worship intentionally, is based on our attitude when we presenting, when we're presenting our gift to him. Now look at the text. Verse 3 says, one more time, let me read that one more time. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and their fat portions. Now watch this. And the Lord had regard, my translation says, for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was ticked off or angry, and his countenance or his face fell. Let me stop there one more time. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard, so Cain was angry and his face fell. I want to keep it real for a moment. If I'm Cain, a lot more than my face is falling. Let me explain. Here's what I said to you. Hey, God, you didn't ask for this. You ought to be happy I'm bringing you something. Come on, can we talk this morning? Can we be real? I mean, hey, God, do I need to replay chapter one for you? Hey, uh, I mean, I know I'm going to be dead by the time this happened, but Leviticus ain't even here yet. So why are you punishing me for stuff that ain't even written down? Can we talk this morning, y'all? Okay, are you with me? So, so lock into this, right? Both boys bring an, a minha, or offering to God, from the jobs that they had at the time. And, and hear this. Very, very important for you to understand. The type of offering did not really matter. So don't over-spiritualize stuff. And talk about, well, it was a blood sacrifice and God wanted blood. No, no, don't come up with that stuff because it's not written down nowhere yet. Are you hearing me? Yet and still, we find that one was accepted and the other was rejected. What is that all about? He looked with regard on Abel, but on Cain and his offering, the Bible says, he had no regard. Put my definition of the word regard. I want y'all to see this so we can talk to this. Here's what that Hebrew word means, saha. Here's what it says. Regard means this, to look with favor, to have regard for or to receive a gift or other object as acceptable, to pay attention to. I underline that because I particularly, if I was translating the Bible, I would use that word. To have regard, to believe and accept information is true, implying both trust and a proper response to the object of truth. So here's, here, here's, here's what that looks like. Here's what that means. Cain brings his offering, and we don't know, we don't know how it happened because there's no mention of altar. We don't know that. But in this worship experience, he brings his offering, and he gives it to God, and God kind of does one of these numbers. You done yet? Then Abel comes, and Abel brings his offering, and he offers it to God. Paraphrase. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Dude, man, you hit that nail on the head, bro. He was a brother. You know God was a brother, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's, what, that's what's up. That's what's up. That's what's up, yeah. <laughs> that's what's up. Yeah, you were saying that stuff like that. <laughs> Pray for me, amen. Yeah. And, and now watch this now. Very important. Abel goes away. Conversation ends with God. Cain sees this, and the Bible says his countenance fell, and he had an attitude. Okay? I'm still with Cain. What's up? So you're wondering why, what went wrong? Why all of a sudden when there is no law? Jesus, when there is nothing written about what this offering should be and what it should look like, all of a sudden, volitionally, they're bringing their gifts, and God pays attention to one, and he doesn't pay attention to the other, okay? Hear this, and we're going to flesh it out over the upcoming weeks. The type of gift did not matter 
It was the attitude in presenting the gift that made all the difference. Okay? Where are you getting that from, preacher? I'm sure in a little while, but if you want to jump ahead to Hebrews, here's what Hebrews 11 says, right? By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, right? So with that piece of information, well, what's a better sacrifice? What is that all about? What what does that mean, right? And why does God accept one and not the other? Here's here's what this looked like to kind of help you all figure this out, right? Here's what this looked like. Cain is going in his garden. And he's with his daddy, and he's watching stuff grow. And all of a sudden, man, this juicy, this thing produces the first time from the ground. And it's this big, juicy pomegranate. And that jerk will look right. And he's like, oh, man, that's, that's uh, God who? You know, and, and he, he hangs on to that thing for, me, for him. Lock into this, right? And then all of a sudden he goes on, and then another one comes out. It's not as big as the other one. And it might be, we don't know that. We don't know that. Um, but he takes that thing, and he takes subsequent things, not like it was the first. And then he comes, and he offers it to God. Okay, I'm, I'm, walk, work with me here. We're almost done. Abel, on the other hand, is watching his sheep. And the first sheep that comes out, bah, he grabs that first thing and sets it aside for God. And when it came time for the offering, he said, God, listen to the word, listen to the word, listen to the word. First fruits. This is the first thing that comes out. Y'all might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with that. You hear, here's what's wrong with it. The very first thing that came out since God has an affinity for the firstborn, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. So whenever I take the first of anything and I take care of me before I take care of God, I'm telling God, I'm God, I'm first, and he, are oh, y'all not hearing me this morning, and you're second, and I put myself in the place of God. And God says this. This is, this is moving ahead. Exodus chapter 20. I'm a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. And hear this. Anytime we do anything to anyone or any situation before God, we have the wrong attitude because God is not who we say he is to us. Uh, Amen kind of got light right there. Truth is truth. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Abel says, hey, God, man, I realized this wasn't me. Had nothing to do with me. So, thank you. Cain, on the other hand, says, me first, because the Bible still says he brought some, he brought some, he brought some, he didn't bring the first fruit, he brought some, he didn't bring the first fruit, and he brought the second thing, and he comes to God, and he says like this, hey, Lord, check this out, thank you, and God's like this. Wow. Here's my concern. Here's my concern. This is why I'm using the term worship. A lot of us come on Sunday, and we do this, here, God. Here's my song. Here's my song. And and we sing to him and he's going like this. Because our attitude is wrong. He's really not first. We are. Are you with me? And he's saying to me, to us, don't bring your second stuff to me. Oh, Jesus. And expect me to remain God in your life and be who I am. Come, this is going to make sense in the upcoming weeks. You got to hear this. You got to hear it. He says, I am God all by myself. I created you. I gave you the activities of your limbs. I gave you the breath that you're breathing. Yeah, you got sick and you thought the doctor healed you, but I gave the doctor the know-how that the doctor has to do what the doctor did. Come on. I know you got in a car accident and the airbag popped out and you thought the airbag saved you. Well, no, no, no. I created the engineer that made the airbag. Come on. And gave him what he needed at the right time to design that thing. Don't fool yourself into thinking that any man on the face of the the earth can ever replace me. The least you want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let him be first in our lives. First. First. Because here's what he says when we bring our secondhand stuff. Don't bring that to me. I ain't no secondhand God. 
you take that to the God who's first until you change some things. Kind of said this jokingly this morning, but I was kind of serious about it. For some of us, we need to go to First Bank and say thank you. Because that's where all Comcast or Verizon. Because that's who we've placed before God. I can't God because there's another God that exists in your place. <laughs> That's scary. That's scary. That's what he said to these guys, right? Don't bring your stuff. And I, I'm almost done with this. I'm almost done with this because we're going to pick this up because y'all are like, oh, Lord, oh, we going to hell. No, you're not. He loves you. No, you're not. No, you're not. Okay, he loves you. No, you're not. No, you're not. Don't go there. You're not. Watch this and I'm done. Abel comes and Abel brings him first fruit. This is very, very important. I think I'm more excited about this part of the series because this goes somewhere. And Abel comes and he says, thank you. And God doesn't say nothing. And Abel doesn't say nothing. And the conversation ends. Right? Cain comes. Cain says, thank you. And that's God now re-engages him in dialogue because of his behavior. That's striking to me. Because lock into this. When, when Abel came, Abel's attitude was so pure that he gave God his minha with a pure attitude, not expecting nothing from God but to keep God first and to make him happy. Now, here's the principle that we're going to flesh out in the upcoming weeks. Abel had sense enough to realize, if I can keep God happy, my sheep's going to keep producing. Y'all miss that? Let me. He had sense enough to realize, if I can keep, let me say it a New Testament term, the wrath of God away from me. The sun is going to rise every morning. Come on. And I'm going to be blessed. So he had sense enough to realize, happy God, happy life. Fellas, y'all know it this way. Happy wife. Yeah, y'all know it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, long as Pastor Katani is smiling, guess who else is smiling? Come on, y'all. But the moment she walk in, what's wrong? Don't tell me. No, no, no. Guess what I'm not doing? I'm not smiling because everything is ruined. Right? This guy had sense enough to realize, I'm going to flesh this out. If I can give God and please God, it's all about pleasing him. The rest is on him. Very, very important. Very, very important. Not no manipulation, not no anything, just gratitude. Let God do what God's going to do. Now, here's the flip side, and we're going to talk about this next week. Cain, on the other hand, messed up. And all of a sudden, he got a two. Bad attitude. Countenance fell, jacked up. I'm the firstborn, and he's going to take the secondborn stuff. What kind of foolishness is this? That ain't even in the word. Come on, man. Why, why God's going to treat me like that? Bad attitude. Here's what God said to him. Hey, Cain, dialogue. Remember dialogue. Dialogue. What's up? This is free. Even after he sinned, they were still in fellowship. Y'all get that? Isn't that deep? He messed up. And God didn't wait for him to get it right. God said, hey, what's up, man? Don't leave me. Let's talk this out. Oh, my gosh, there's so much there. There's so much there. God comes to him. What's up? Why are you mad? Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Then he makes this interesting statement. Just flip the script. You're going to get the same thing he got. I'm going to pay attention to you if you do the right thing. We're going to flesh that out next week. Very, very important. Very, very important. Okay? God engages him when he messes up to give him an opportunity to make it right. Okay? I'm going to end on this note. That's what I love the most about God is when I mess up, he doesn't turn his back on me. He engages me to give me an opportunity to make it right. 
oh my gosh, is that grace a lot? If that is not a reason to say thank you, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. So, so here's where I want to stop because we're going to pick this up next week. I want you all to process this with me. Check your attitude. I have to check mine all the time. How do I approach God? How do I worship God? What does that look like? Is, is everything in the world occupying space, time, and God is not first anymore? We must get him back to where he rightfully belongs. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want you all to pray. Worship team, just stay still. I'll just take Dominique. And I need you to bow your heads with me. And we're a little over, so I apologize for that, but we can do things a little differently. Bow your heads with me. God engaged me this week. And he engaged me in dialogue because I probably messed up, didn't do things right, and he gave me a chance to do it right. And, and you're human like me, so I know we blow it. So right where you're sitting, in your own way, take a moment to say, God, thank you for engaging me in dialogue and allow me to hear your word and to do it right. Take a moment right where you are. And then recovenant, right? Recovenant. God, the minha belongs to you. You don't care about type. You don't care about type. Type's not important. It's attitude, God, the attitude, and it should be that of gratitude, thanking you. So we repent this morning for placing things before you. We repent this morning for having what I'm going to call Cain's attitude. Forgetting the fact that you are God and fooling ourselves into thinking that we are God. It's not that we don't love you. We love you, God, but we love us first if we're honest with ourselves. So forgive us for that. Forgive us for that, Lord. Teach us to love you first. Teach us to love you first. And God, should there be one here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior and they heard of your grace, of your eminence, of your love, the fact that you're there and you approach us and you initiate conversations with us. If there's one here that have not said yes to you, God, draw them to a relationship with you. Let them say, I want to give my heart to God. I want to know God like that. And so, God, as we engage this passage of Scripture, as we learn more about this principle of the right attitude in worship, mold our heart Godward. We love you. And so, God, I thank you for your grace. As a congregation, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, that you love us in spite of us. Give our hearts to you, God. In your own way, take about 30 seconds and take what you need to take to God, to take it to him, yeah. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Yeah. We need you, God. 